Hello, Roland. It's a pleasure to have you with us and to hear about your work. It's very fascinating the stuff that you're doing, looking at social knowledge in the brain. And I wonder if you could just talk us through the model that you've built up so far of how we sort of have this knowledge in the brain and how exactly it's computed. Thank you very much, Susan. Th thanks very much for having me. So yeah, I was what I was talking about in the talk was the model in 2005 that we've um, proposed, which has three main components. Two of those components are very relevant for social knowledge. Uh, one is the more abstract knowledge of um, social concepts, for example, what it means to feel, be honest or stingy or greedy, um, which is important for interpreting social behavior across different contexts. And also that means cultural contexts, for example, you know, I've, I've just talked about this with my students yesterday. And I asked them, is there anyone who changes the way, the way they greet people when they get, travel home? And then one of the Spanish students said, yes, of course, because when I tried to greet people here with kisses, um, like I do at home, I got a negative response. Yeah. And so I, I now automatically change. Um, but um, what I try to explain is that this abstract knowledge of um, what it means to be polite it stays the same thing. It's just we have different actions in different cultures and contexts, um, but the meaning of it is still politeness. So there's a bit that's about knowing what it is. Is it yeah. right? So, is it wrong? Is it polite? Is it rude? Yeah, and that's the, the more context-independent uh, understanding, which I've uh, presented evidence um, is represented in the right um, anterior temporal lobe in the superior sector of that right anterior temporal lobe. And then there's the second component which allows us to then have a very flexible, uh, still long-term memory representation of the context appropriate behavior. So that borrows the model that I've explained by Jordan Grafman, I've worked with as my supervisor in, at the NIH, who had this idea that the frontal cortex is a long-term memory store of sequences of events and actions, uh, these so-called scripts. Um, and that's very relevant, of course, in a social situation as well. You know, what's the sequence of events that is expected, say, if you're on a date or, you know, and how does that sequence vary? Um, and um, that's very relevant and that's very culture dependent, as we saw in some of the examples I've given for the task we've developed to probe this knowledge. Yeah. of the uh, consequences of your actions. Would it be fair to sort of think of that in terms of, well, there's an anterior temporal lobe element of holding together what is the concept of being polite or rude or stingy, and the frontal mm -hmm. lobe is the how do you be polite? It's true, but... Depending on the yeah. context. So I think that's, that's a good way of putting it, although, I, as I've explained, it's probably the model is a network model where you also yeah. need the subcortical representations, which are a free-floating, context-free, emotional, motivational state that provides you with the motivational force to, to yeah. act on these things. But also, something I've not talked about in the talk, but one a, a person in the audience was interested in autism. We've had this nice discussion about the posterior superior temporal sulcus, which uh, in our model is relevant for the sense, so, so pick, picking up social sensory cues, you know, gaze, voice, uh, posture. And that is probably also relevant for the how to, because if you want to communicate um, something in a specific context, you probably need that sensory um, information as well. Um, yeah, so, so that's, and I've presented lesion evidence primarily on the frontal bits, the frontopolar cortex. Um, the subgeneral cortex, um, which is an interesting region um, just sitting between the subcortical uh, bits of the network and the, the cortical network, and, and then the anterior temporal lobe. Your particular interest in this is what it tells us about understanding self-knowledge or social knowledge and depression. Yeah. So, so what I was always struck by is that the, um, the brain regions that are relevant for neurodegenerative disorders such as frontotemporal dementia are also very relevant for mood disorders. I haven't talked about mania um, because that's quite difficult to study, um, getting people in the right mood state free mm. of medication. But in depression, what I've been talking about is the, the observation is of an overgeneralized form of self-blame um, and that then 
makes people feel worthless and that's quite transcultural as a symptom and and consistent and the model that we we've developed to explain that was around uh, the disruption of the functional integration of information but in the network so it's a subtle problem in that network it's not a lesion like in people with frontotemporal dementia but the, the the really interesting bit about this um subtle uh, difference is the idea that it's dependent on the content of what you're thinking about. So the network connectivity seems to change depending on whether you, f you think about uh, self-blame or self-criticism compared to thinking about uh, your best friend doing something bad and you feeling angry about it. And I think that's why it's so difficult to measure. So you can't just measure the structure of the brain because the structure presumably needs to be intact enough to then uh, lead the network to connect normally um, when you feel anger towards others. Mm. You were talking about how actually, because the measure that you've looked at there is functional connectivity. Mm -hmm. And as you said, it's not like the structure is disrupted, it's clearly able to still subserve most of its normal function. But it's its sort of responsivity to these particular contexts or particular states of reference, for example, with respect to oneself. And one of the ideas that you've talked about is a bit of an overgeneralization of self-blame mm -hmm. and the idea that people feel bad about everything or responsible for everything. Mm -hmm. And how that's something that seems to go quite badly wrong in depression, where there's no longer that ability to kind of separate things out, look at them in a wider context. So, so I think that's well summarized, but I, I'd say it's the, the striking thing is that I've, you know, I've talked to people in very severe depression and the interesting thing is if you ask them how do you feel about, how do you think about your best friend, how would they have handled the situation and you know, that, I still remember that uh, patient saying to me, yeah, of course they're much better than I am, they would have perfectly done it well. So this is always, when I hear this, say, this, this talk about negative emotions and depression and people with depression have more negativity and less positivity, I think it doesn't describe what I've observed and what you really read if you go into the description yeah. of cognitive therapy, the people are actually very positive about others. It's just the, 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 the relative relationship between self and others is always the inferiority of the self. Um, and that is a very complex bias that yeah. um, that's what we're trying to understand with this model. Yes, and I think that's certainly what we do see in that sense mm. of personal inadequacy or mm. worthlessness or failure that you can get people to take an outside perspective and ask how their friend would comment and they can be much more empathic to mm -hmm. themselves from an external perspective. Have you observed that as well? In some yes, yeah. Yeah, so they can be kind of, if you push people to sort of mm. how would somebody else see this mm. and there is certainly that cognitive ability, yes I think somebody else would be more kind mm. but yet at the very end that slip of but they'd be making a mistake because I'm not really worthy mm. of it. That while you mm. can still hold that, at the end it still comes back to, but I'm an exception, mm. usually in a negative way, of course. Mm. You're an affective disorders clinician yourself and your interest is in treatment-resistant depression. How do you see the relevance of this to the clinic? Are NHS services looking after people with depression? I think at this stage, uh, what it uh, helps with is understanding um, the depression better and when discussing it. But it's, uh, I think the, most of the applications are really um, things that we hope to be achieving in the future. So what I've shown this um, model where we've, this prediction model where we've been able to predict uh, recurrence risk at an individual level using imaging clinical information and a novel cognitive task. This was a relatively small group of people and we've just received funding from the MRC to replicate this in a larger group. And if successful, then this, this could be uh, really important for, uh, especially if we can replace the fMRI, which is quite expensive, uh, then that could be really relevant for um, the, the question of should people stop their antidepressant, which is a very difficult decision. Mm -hmm. Because basically right now, uh, the clinical information is so poor at predicting who will have another episode that it's like to uh, tossing a coin. So, um, and that means people are 
um, often quite unsure whether they should stop or continue the medication. Um, the other application is using brain training, um, using fMRI, it's called neurofeedback, to help people retrain those um, networks. And we've done two trials um, and they've shown some promising results, but um, I've also explained that we need uh, another trial to try and tease out which patients are um, profiting from this. So it seemed that only a particular group of people uh, profited from our specific brain training approach. There are other brain training approaches out there. Um, so I think in the next 10 years or so, it could well be that one of these approaches is successful, um, but um, it's not there yet. Um, for, for It's not available and not that the, the evidence isn't strong enough to suggest it as a clinical treatment. Your findings about predicting recurrence are actually very intriguing because they do speak to actually looking at the clinical phenotype in a far more precise way than the more broad diagnostic construct we use. And as you say, there's a bit to be done there in terms of think, well, the fMRI or the MRI is a bit too much. Is there somewhere we can get around that? But mm. your work does suggest a bit of a bridge between looking at a very particular aspect of the clinical phenotype and an investigational measure that gives you, well, a biological readout of that. But it mm. does give us something a bit more nuanced and sophisticated than what we do in the clinic. And I think that sounds very, very promising in terms mm. of just being able to pick up who's more likely to relapse or have a recurrence. Yeah, thank you. So I think that the reason why I was also interested in doing it is to see if, if something, if you're studying something that you think is relevant to the pathophysiology of depression, then it should be predictive um, in a clinical sense. So it's a good test of your model as well. Yeah. Of course, lots of difficulties if we want to translate it into NHS practice um, it would be best if we could get away from the fMRI. Although, having said that, I still think the uh, a, a half-hour scan uh, of about 250 pounds could be worth uh, paying for in particular populations. For example, if you think of women who think of conceiving, women who've had a depressive history, and they need to make a decision, do I want to stop the medication to conceive? I think this is a hugely important decision. I think 250 pounds is not uh, is, is is justified for helping with that decision. Yeah. Mm. I mean, certainly, ultimately, it does come down to actually what its predictive value is. But yeah. if it was sufficiently predictive, that 250 pounds is potentially saving you, the NHS, and the patient a huge amount mm. of cost down the line yeah. in making actually a very critical clinical decision. Yeah. So I think I agree. I think the probably the health economics needs to be adapted to the specific application um, we're proposing. So, and hopefully we'll know more about that in the next couple of years. Brilliant, thank you so much. Thank you.